if science could provide you with a fuel that would not only reverse the acidification of the oceans, but at the same time actively reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and counter the heating caused by global warming by radiating more energy out into space. And it's been sitting right in front of everyone for decades. But first, you got to understand that global warming took the combined effort of the entire planet for the best part of a century. This wasn't just a, a team effort. It was a multi-generational team effort. All of this was done on burning hydrocarbons that had been happily sequestered out of the atmosphere for millions of years. And then after using the energy to do something useful, build civilization, leaving the combustion products in the atmosphere. But here's the kicker. If you want to reverse that process and resequester those combustion products back as oil underground, the bare minimum energy it would take to do that is the energy you got out from burning it in the first place, which is the energy requirements for the entire population of the planet for the best part of a century. It's simply not viable. And that's ignoring the fact that what well, with things like a thermodynamic limits, that number will be significantly higher. And once you understand the size and scope of the problem, you'll understand why there is no magic solution that can be waved at this. But there might be some emergency band-aids that can be used here. You see, the problem is truly planetary in scale. Imagine all of the power used by mankind, every piece of heat, every bit of energy, every Bitcoin mind, every influencer lifestyle, every last bit of energy used for, say, a year. Now let's compare that to the extra energy that we get from the sun due to global warming over the same period of time. And the answer is global warming heats up the planet about 10 times as much as all of the energy production of mankind. That is, all of the energy of mankind actually eventually ends up as heat in the atmosphere. But the extra energy harvested from those legacy waste products in the atmosphere heated up 10 times more. Then to make things even worse, that heating will be there as long as the extra carbon dioxide is there. So even if we stop carbon dioxide production tomorrow, the legacy carbon dioxide in the atmosphere will be there till it's basically washed out by the oceans, which is decades to hundreds of years. Now that might sound pretty depressing. It's an impossibly high number to try and counter. And to a very real extent, it is until you look at it in another context. Welcome to planet Earth. This is where we were all born and it's where we'll all die. It's a ball spinning in space about once per day, illuminated on one side by the sun and not on the others, with the locals calling the sunny side day and the other side night. Now, pre-global warming, the ball absorbed light from the sun and radiated exactly the same amount back into space. And seeing as it lost the same amount of energy as it gained, there was no change in temperature. Now with global warming, it absorbs about the same amount of energy, but it radiates about one part in a thousand less into space, with carbon dioxide being the main contributor there. <laughs> yes, that's the entirety of global warming, is one part in a thousand extra energy harvested from the sun. At <laughs> which point you might say, well, what, one part in a thousand? That's barely detectable. That's, that's it? That's global warming? Well, yeah, but you've also got to bear in mind it took the best part of 50 years to heat the planet up by about one degree Celsius. And you also got to bear in mind that, you know, planetary, that one part in a thousand extra energy absorbed by the Earth is 10 times the entire energy production of mankind. So we come on to the potential solutions. You need a fuel which you can produce with solar, quick and easy, and one you can burn to create energy to run engines, and where the exhaust products will absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and add to the cooling of the planet. Put simply, it's sodium. Now, everyone's first response on hearing that is sodium, the stuff that explodes in water. You're crazy. Well, yes and no. You see, on the plus side, sodium reacts with water to give sodium hydroxide and hydrogen and energy. 
and then that hydrogen also burns to give you even more energy. So the first hurdle comes is, is sodium like this even energy dense enough to use as a fuel? And the answer is yes, both as a fuel and a hybrid fuel. So with a hybrid fuel, this is where the magic really happens in that we're going to start off with our sodium, which we're going to burn in some water, specifically two waters, which is going to give us some sodium hydroxide and some hydrogen. And if you're wondering what that might look like, this is what an alkali metal looks like burning in a steam atmosphere. Uh, but of course, we want to burn that hydrogen to make water. So we're going to need a little bit extra oxygen here. Now that's dead easy, of course. You just get oxygen from the air. It means you don't have to carry it around with you. It doesn't count as a weight of the fuel. But water, yeah, I can't get from the air. There's not enough of it there. So you would have to get the you'd have to carry the water around with you, which means that it weighs, you know, these weigh about the same as each other. So this basically yeah, you know, halves the energy density of your fuel right there. So this is a big sort of crash and burn moment. So where might we be able to get some water for free, as it were? And this is where it gets interesting. Yeah, of course, when we do this combustion here, we get loads of energy out at the end. So what happens now if we burn some hydrocarbon? In this instance, I'm just going to go for methane, regular methane. Most all fossil fuels are kind of the same in constitution. But I'm just going to use methane for the moment. And we're going to burn that in the oxygen in the air. Need two of those, and that's going to give us some carbon dioxide, which is, of course, our greenhouse gas. That's the one that we really don't want to be emitting. And also, it's going to give us some water and a load of energy, of course. And that's what you use to run your, your engines. And that's wonderfully energy dense um, stuff. However, you'll notice one of the combustion products that we get out of this. One of our exhaust gases is actually water. Almost exactly the amount of water we need to react with our sodium. So if we were to put in a mixture of one methane and two sodiums, it would burn completely. But doesn't this give off carbon dioxide, I hear you ask? Well, this is where it gets interesting. So when we add all of this together, what we're going to do is we're going to take a methane and two sodiums and some oxygen and we're going to burn all of that to make ah now this is where it gets interesting carbon dioxide and sodium hydroxide react together to make sodium carbonate which also gives off some energy and that also releases a water now there's various ways of doing this of course but the easiest is you've just got four hydrogens there uh, so this means you're going to end up with two waters at the end here and even more heat so the way that you traditionally burn gasoline is in an engine is you nebulize it to make lots of little droplets uh, which you then mix with the air and the oxygen in the air and then you light it and in that big flame you get all your energy released and that's what you use to drive your engine now, in this case, you would actually have to mix your sodium in as very finely divided particles into the gasoline and then do the same injection. But in principle, this now doesn't emit any carbon dioxide at all. Even though you're burning fossil fuels, you're not emitting any carbon dioxide. Now, in terms of energy density, you lose some, of course, here. So if you take regular gasoline, that's about uh, 46 megajoules per kilogram. This, if you actually go through the numbers, comes out at uh, about um, 26 megajoules per kilogram. Very similar to alcohol, which is about 30 megajoules per kilogram. So this is actually sort of sensible heat, en heat engine numbers with the, of course, added advantage that you burn this one, you release carbon dioxide. You burn this one, you release carbon dioxide. This one is here completely carbon neutral. It adds no extra carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. And indeed, it's it's possible that this might even help to reflect some of the sunlight away from the Earth. Now, some might say, what? Your engine is going to produce sodium carbonate, a solid 
as an exhaust. Well, yeah, like I was saying earlier, all engines basically run on generating lots of heat and then using that to expand gases, which essentially do the driving of the physical machinery. And the fact that 80% of our atmosphere is nitrogen means that most of the expansion stuff is going to be done by nitrogen. That sodium carbonate that you generate will probably look like this. And this is half of the point why I'm proposing using this as a fuel. But the bottom line is, this isn't stupid in terms of energy density, which is probably the most important factor when you're considering a fuel. Energy density is the reason why we use fossil fuels in the first place, because they are king when it comes to energy density. Well, that plus the only costs associated with it, uh, the cost of digging it out of the ground and refining it. But for certain, no matter how you incorporate sodium into your fuel, either as a fuel or a hybrid fuel, the exhaust will be strongly alkaline, which will help reverse the acidification of the oceans. And in the event that you use sodium as a fuel, it will actively pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Sodium is, of course, way too expensive to be used as a fuel at the moment. But a lot of this is because there is no mass market for the stuff. Fundamentally, the cost of making sodium is the cost of electrolyzing the molten sodium chloride, which, of course, can be done anywhere in the world, say, for instance, near the equator, where you don't need lots of volts to run these things, and you've got lots of good solar energy. But the main reason I became interested in this was a bizarre observation of something that happens when sodium explodes in water, which I've been dropping Easter eggs into my videos about since 2015. Yeah, it's likely that these reactions will have some very interesting electronic and nanoscopic properties. That's not just blowing smoke, because there's something else about these reactions that no one seems to have noticed and something that shouldn't be there. You get these dense aerosols. A mist, which I showed to a visiting climate scientist, and he gave me an estimate based on an estimate of the settling time of mist like this, which is very persistent, that these droplets were nanometer in size. So what I hear you say, it explodes and creates a dense, stable aerosol. Well, this is interesting on two fronts. You might remember that whole nuclear winter thing which was basically, you get lots of aerosols, soot in this case, into the upper atmosphere, and it would cool the planet down significantly. Well, it's not alone. Turns out that one part in a thousand extra energy that we're now getting from the sun can be broken down into two factors. The actual extra energy harvested from the carbon dioxide and the methane is actually nearer two parts per thousand, but we reflect one part per thousand extra into space because of things like aerosols, in cloud effects. Now, the nice thing about aerosols is you don't need much of them to have a large effect, especially if they're in the right part of the atmosphere. And so something that generates a lot of aerosols is interesting. And the smaller the particles, the better the bang for the buck you get out of your fuel. Now, at this point, a lot of eco people will start losing their minds using words like geoengineering. Well, again, yes and no. We have already geoengineered the planet, unintentionally as it turns out, but we've still geoengineered the planet. The question is, having unintentionally geoengineered it, can you intentionally de-geoengineer it? You don't need much here. At a simple level, you've got to increase the cloud cover by one part in a thousand, and basically, you're done. Which leads us to an interesting property of this choking evil smoke that you get off burning sodium. It's an excellent nucleation source for water. Put simply, clouds. Now, I should stress, there are some significant drawbacks of using sodium as a fuel. The most obvious one being you can't use it anywhere near where people live. Sodium hydroxide is basically drain cleaner. Yes, the exhaust of this engine would be drain cleaner. And if you think that that's maybe crazily non-environmentally friendly, maybe think again. Where? is drain cleaner traditionally flushed? Well, yeah, down the drain into the water supply, that where, first of all, dilution and the fact that it absorbs carbon dioxide means that it's fine. Well, that's what burning sodium as fuel would do for you. It's diluted into the atmosphere, creates aerosols, and then would fairly rapidly pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere to create essentially harmless carbonates, which at some point would precipitate out 
by one mechanism or another, probably as calcium carbonate. But the fact that a fresh exhaust would be this evil alkali choking smoke means that you couldn't use this in cities or on land in power stations. Over the oceans though, this would be ideal. Firstly, most of the planet is covered by oceans, and that's the bit that you want to deacidify. And if you were to create a fraction of a percent extra cloud cover over the oceans, that would also be fine. So the two places where you might see this working, uh, yeah, either burning sodium in water or sodium as part of a hybrid fuel, or even maybe just as an additive, are in cargo ships and in planes. Yes, this does mean that chemtrails would now become real. A real planet-saving thing. Now, creating engines that can handle such a novel fuel is a real technical challenge, and the effects on climate will be complicated. But within the venue of countering global warming, this isn't as crazy as it sounds. And while the idea of combating climate change with aerosols isn't new, doing it with a hybrid fuel is. Great, I hear you say, do it now. Well, I'm not the bullshit merchant who will happily promise that all of these problems can be easily solved. And look, here's an artist impression of what it's going to look like when it's working, which is great for headlines, but not so much for the actual science. But sure, whatever. To prove it's not as silly as it sounds, I'm going to do some experiments to get the ball rolling. Here on this channel, I'm going to do a few more in-depth demos of how I think this thing can pan out. Think hybrid sodium flamethrower. Scary as hell, but then again, you have to bear in mind that the energy density of gas is higher than that of sodium. And all an engine is, is basically a way of harvesting the energy given off by a flamethrower. And if you think this is an awesome idea that might actually just save the planet, well, you might want to share this video with like, um, uh, everyone! And maybe I should be asking for Kickstarter money or something. No, my patrons have made sure that I don't have to waste time on that sort of thing. And if that's one of you guys out there, well, thanks. You're the guys who made this possible.